are released to Children's Church. And we follow Kim out. So there is a statement if you tell somebody about Jesus Christ or invite them to church or get into any sort of spiritual discussion with somebody, eventually it's going to come up and they're going to say, what do I get out of it? What's in it for me? If I do all this commitment stuff and I read my Bible every day, what do I get out of it? That can be confusing to some Christians, people who have been Christians for a while, we, we know what we get out of it, but it's kind of hard to put it into words. And so Paul actually answers that question in verse 6 of 2 Timothy 2, and then he, in verses 7 through 19, explains his answer and backs it up with biblical evidence. And what he says is the answer it is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of his crops. And you say, huh? Well, in Paul's day, everybody was either a farmer or related to a farmer or knew a farmer. It was a farming community. It was agrarian. It was agricultural. Uh, and all of their food was mostly vegetables and came freshly out of the ground that morning. And so, when he's talking to Christians about what they get out of it, he uses figurative speech, talking about a hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Now, what does he mean by hard-working? Well, consider what a farmer does. A farmer is a slave to the sun. He is, has to be up when the sun's up, get out there in the fields, has to stop when the sun goes down, didn't have flashlights, and you don't farm by flashlights anyway. If you've ever been to the Middle East or seen the Middle East, it's a desert, and you're trying to grow wheat in the desert, you've got to bring water in, you've got to bring irrigation, you've got to do fertilizer, which was very fresh back then, and there was no machinery, there was no, uh, you know, the trucks or combines or anything it was all done by hand. If you were rich enough, you could actually buy some oxen to pull the plow. But when it came to actually putting the seeds in the ground and making irrigation trenches and harvesting, uh, that was all done by hand. And it was difficult backbreaking work. Hopefully, you had a large family. So you can make all your kids go out there and do the farming with you. But large family or not, it was very manual. And a person was also um, a slave to the seasons. You had to plant when it was proper to plant and harvest when it was proper to harvest. And if you weren't feeling good or whatever, it didn't matter. If it was time to harvest, it was time to harvest. And that's why they would have huge harvest parties where they would celebrate and they would get together and they would sing and they would dance because the long waiting was over and now they were able to harvest and as part of the harvest celebration they would give the first share or the first choice of the crops to the farmer and his family as a thank you for feeding the community. Also realized that it was months between planting and harvest and with no refrigeration. If they didn't save enough dried food from the last harvest, they could get very hungry and they could even starve. And so the idea of a farmer is, and the hard work that is necessary, is very akin to a Christian and the work that we do. The, the word for hard work actually means intensely toil to the point of exhaustion. Uh, we need to be totally sold out. We need to put it all into following Jesus Christ. We need to realize that the harvest is the return of Jesus Christ, and we need to be planting and working 
in the lives of other people. The first shares that can be available for Christians are the growth of those we invest in. Uh, most people who are involved in a church are involved in some sort of ministry working with people. And over time, if we invest properly, if we invest the Word of God, if we plant seeds of the glorifying of God, we can harvest growth. We can actually see people change. We can see people grow closer to God. We can actually, as we do this, see ourselves grow and see ourselves grow closer to God. And ultimately, our reward is heaven for all eternity. The main thing that we're working for is uh, spending eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. Uh, this toiling, this, this work, this hard work that we are doing down here uh, will end, and there will be a time in which it will be an eternal Sabbath rest in heaven with Jesus Christ. And so when we're working for Christ, the question of what do we get out of it, what's in it for me, ultimately, it is eternity in bliss in heaven, which is going to be wonderful and amazing and better than the alternative. Paul then says, uh, the Lord will give you understanding of everything. He says, think about what I'm saying. He says, ponder what I'm saying. And the idea that the Lord will give understanding is very important for our, for our current day because it's very easy to say, I heard this or I saw this or God showed me this on a TV show or God showed me this in a song and go off on some sort of strange tangent about what God is telling you rather than stopping and when you are confused to go directly to the source and the first source that we need to go to is the Bible. If we don't know what God is doing, if we are confused about what God is trying to accomplish, if, for example, we look at the news and we're scared about what's happening in the Middle East, uh, we can go to the Bible and we can read the Old Testament and we can see that every conflict that Israel was involved in, God was also involved, and it was more important for Israel to be righteous than to be militarily prepared. God would cause them to win if they were following his law and cause them to lose if there was sin. And so we can say, aha, that's how God works. And so we can pray for the righteousness of Israel. We can pray that they will turn to him. And things like this, when things happen in your life, when you're working in a church and, and there are conflicts with people, we can turn to God and we can say, you know, how does this work? And we look at the letters of Paul and every church he wrote to. There was conflicts between people and we can see how to handle it. We also need to pray. When we read the Bible, we need to ask God directly. What does this mean? What is going on? Why do I do all this hard work and I see no results? Or whatever is going on in your mind. We need to pray over what we're reading in the Bible. And we need to hang out with other hardworking Christians, and we find those in church. It's a, a very good thing to do if you are having a struggle, a difficulty with a passage, a difficulty with an event in your life. Come and ask somebody in church. And I'm sure they have you know, looked at that or had that same experience themselves. Most Christian experiences are common. And we need this community. And there are people who will pick one or two of these things who will say, well, I just have the Bible. I don't need to go to church. You know, the church is a bunch of hypocrites. That's a popular one today. And they realize that they, they don't get as much out of the Bible as when they're with other Christians and bouncing ideas off of other people and working together as hardworking farmers. Consider a farmer that is a lone guy, a single man with no kids and no wife, uh, he's going to have a very small crop, he's going to have a very small land. But you have a, a man, perhaps he has brothers, perhaps they have 12, 15 kids all together. I mean, that whole team can, can farm a, a great area 
and feed the whole community. And in the same way, we, when we are joined with other Christians, can be much more effective in getting the word out, much more effective in praying for the things that go on in the world. Paul then defends the hard work by saying that uh, Jesus Christ uh, worked a lot harder than you did, and so him as our example we need to follow. First, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now that is a, a summary statement. If you read the end of all the Gospels, Jesus Christ was arrested, humiliated, beat within an inch of his life, and then nailed to a cross and allowed to die for the sins of the world. Uh, and then he rose from the dead. If you think that it was an easy life that Christ had, uh, the Gospels give us a different view of that. It was a horrendous way to die. It was difficult. It was hard. And if we think that what we're going through is a little bit uncomfortable or a little bit difficult, Paul is saying, well, I'll look to Jesus Christ and perhaps compare your discomfort to his on the cross. Uh, see if that gives you strength. Uh, it tells us that Jesus Christ was in the line of King David, telling us that God is working. God has been working in history, raising up men and women of God, from King David all the way down the line to Joseph and Mary. Uh, and when Jesus Christ was born, he is born in the line of the bloodline of David, and when he sits on the throne in heaven, he is sitting on the throne of David in heaven. Third, as preached by Paul. Uh, Paul is a proclaimer of the word of God. And he's saying that this is what he is proclaiming. Then he says it's why he's also in jail, why he's in chains. So if you think you're having a difficult day, if you think what you're going through is a little uncomfortable, Paul is saying, uh, look at him. You know, at least you're not in jail for the gospel. Uh, Paul was put in jail by Nero and eventually was beheaded for being a Christian. They gave him a quick way out because he was a Roman citizen. Uh, other Christians were burned at the stake, were crucified, and were dipped in hot wax, or dipped in tar. Um, all of the ways the Christians died, uh, we have it. Comparatively easy compared to what Christians have gone through in the past. And Paul says he's bound with chains as a criminal. He was declared a criminal by following Jesus Christ. He says, but praise God, the word of God is not chained. Even though the world may chain the preachers, may chain the missionaries, the word of God will continue and will move out and will affect lives. And so if we are having a, a, a rough day, we just need to look at Jesus Christ and Paul. And then he says to endure everything for the sake of the elect. The idea is that if we endure hardship, if we have a difficult work environment, if we have a difficult family environment, and we are able to glorify Jesus Christ in these times, people will see you and see the peace you have as the world is falling apart. And we'll say, wow, well, if Jesus Christ can give that level of peace, if Jesus Christ can give that level of belonging, then I want that for me. The idea is that there are people, the elect means those who have believed and those who will believe. And one of the greatest witnesses that we can have for the sake of the unsaved is to be godly Christ followers no matter what is happening in the world, no matter what is happening in our lives. We exhibit peace and joy and faithfulness and thanksgiving and gentleness, the fruits of the Spirit, when we are in these difficult situations. And people will see them and say, how come your financial situation is bad but you still have a smile on your face. How come your house is upside down, but you still have a smile on your face? And that is a golden opportunity. I mean, there's a red carpet laid out before you. Somebody is asking you about Jesus Christ. That is the perfect witness opportunity. And you can just say, well, it's, you know, Jesus Christ. And then the Bible of the church, give the Bible, do whatever the Lord leads you to do. Paul then goes into a 
a quoting thing. It's, it's indented in your Bible. And we're not sure where this came from, but the if we die with him, you will also live with him section. Uh, it's believed that in ancient times, this was said during baptism. Uh, we say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There's evidence that when they were baptizing people, as they were lowering them down, they say, if we die with him, we also live with him. And this was their baptism ritual. Let's look at it. We have died with him. We also live with him. Uh, this is in the form of Jewish poetry. This is called a couplet. It has two things, two things, two things, two things. The first two things are positive, and the last two things are negative, and they're kind of mirrors of each other. And probably, if this was in Hebrew or Greek, it might rhyme. We're not sure. If we've died with him, those who accept Jesus Christ uh, die to self. Those who accept Jesus Christ, according to Galatians 2.20, have been crucified with Christ. And we no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who gave himself and died for me. If I am a Christian, my selfishness, my ambition is crucified. And if that happens, and I'm truly saved, then I will live with him. That when he comes again, or I pass away, I will raise from the dead. I will meet him in the air. I will be with him, living for all eternity. If we endure, we will also reign with him. There are those who, who have hardship that we cannot imagine. There is a bulletin board in the lobby that has all the Countries of persecution marked with arrows. Uh, those are countries where it is illegal or dangerous to be a Christian. Uh, we get the sense from the Bible that those who endure hardship, those who are martyred for their faith, will get a special reward, will get a special something in heaven that those who did not go through such hardships do not get. We're both saved and there won't be any envy or there won't be any that's not fair in heaven but God seems to favor those who go through risking their life to be a Christian uh, more than those who don't if we deny him he will also deny us uh, those who are saying shame of Christ those who deny anything about Christ, perhaps they believe in Jesus Christ, but don't believe he died for my sins. Or they believe in God, but not Jesus Christ, or some portion of that. If we do not believe in the Jesus Christ of the Bible, and we have not opened our hearts to him, then when it's all said and done, Jesus Christ is going to say, I don't know you. Um, that's the deal. You accept him, he accepts you. You reject him, he will reject you. Lastly, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. The faith here is saving faith. If we have no saving faith, uh, God will not, God is not crippled. There are those who say, well, I don't believe in God. Like that seems to matter to God. God's existence does not matter whether you believe in him or not. God's existence doesn't matter whether you accept him or not. God will take those who have accepted him and save them, and God will give everybody else who rejects him, who have no saving faith, who are faithless, uh, will give them what they deserve for all eternity. And so if we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. But if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we are faithless. He remains faithful to those who accept him. He will remain faithful to his word. Jesus Christ died on the cross for each individual, and he still would have done it if only one person would have accepted him. Uh, he loves us so much that he would have died for just one. Fortunately, there are hundreds of millions of Christians throughout the years, uh, billions maybe, there's a billion Catholics, they say now. So there are a great response, and we praise God for that, but there are many who reject and God will give them what they want, and that is eternity away from Him. 
so we need to make sure that we are faithful and believing in faith. Paul ends by giving us two things to avoid and one thing to pursue. We need to avoid quarreling about words. Uh, that means meanings. Uh, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And we speak English, and so we have English translations, and there are our people today who say, well, that word was translated wrong, or that word doesn't mean that, or, or the Bible changed somehow. We quarrel about words and, and word order and what this word means. Um, that, that just leads to, to silliness. I mean, you know, you get nowhere arguing over it because if you read sections of the Bible, there are themes, there are concepts that are clear, no matter what the word order is, no matter if it's a best translation or a pretty good translation. We can get what the Bible is about if we read large sections of it. If we get down with a magnifying glass and go, well, that is, should be at, and that, you know, that, that messes up. But people did that back then because, remember, Paul was Roman, and the Romans spoke Latin back then, and so they had Latin Bibles, and they had translations, and people got all caught up in what this word means and what that means. And they, they miss the forest for the trees, as they say. Uh, Jesus said they uh, swallow a camel trying to sift out a gnat. Um, so we need to get to the big picture of what the Bible says. And we need to avoid irreverent babble. Uh, irreverent means disrespecting God. Uh, babble means making no sense, and so we can talk about anything in church, but if our talk disrespects God, it doesn't necessarily have to be swearing. Uh, a lot of people say irreverent means swearing. It can just mean misquoting God. It can mean saying strange things about who Christ was or what Christ did or bringing in these other gospels and things that we have today. Anything that disrespects God has no place in the church. So what do we do? Well, we pursue, we present ourselves as one approved. Uh, we present ourselves as one approved because if you are a Christian, you are fully and absolutely approved. You can't fail. You can't lose. God will never look down on you. God will never count your sins against you. So you win. You get an A+. Plus. If you are a Christian, God sees you as perfect. However, if I look in the mirror, I don't look very perfect. So I need to live a life that lives up to how God sees me. I need to live a life that tries to reach what God wants me to be, how God already sees me, how God has already rated me. And so I present myself as one approved. I can't be disapproved, but I have to work to live up to it. And I need to be able to rightly handle the truth. The truth is the Word of God, the Bible, uh, the truth about Jesus Christ. I need to handle it with respect. I need to know what it is. I need to know the big picture message. I need to handle truth correctly. And if I handle truth correctly, then I can actually, through the power of the Holy Spirit, live a little more righteously, have a little more holiness in my life, and... When God sees me, I won't have earned anything, but he will truly say, "Good done, well done, good and faithful servant, because I did my best, I tried hard, I worked hard like a farmer of old would work hard, and I rightly handled the truth. What you have to realize is if you are a Christian, God knows who you are and will not allow you to fall between the cracks. Uh, if you're a Christian, you are saved, you are always saved, and if it is difficult, if it is hard, if there is persecution, God has not forgotten you. At the end of time, God will lift you up, you will be glorified, so He is glorified, and together, we will all spend eternity in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that is what you get. And if somebody says... What is in it for me? The truth is, eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. And that is the goal of every Christian, and that's what we're working for, and God has guaranteed it. You can't work yourself out of it. You can't sin too much to get out of it. 
If you accepted Jesus Christ, you are in and you're stuck. And you will be with him for all eternity. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I praise you. I praise you that we are stuck. That uh, once we accept you, we have it all. We have full acceptance. And our response is to work hard. To do what you would have us to do. Not that we're earning anything. But that we're trying to live up to the grace that you have given to us. Lord, I praise you that you are a person, you are a God of your word, that what you say is true and will last for all eternity. I thank you that I have a place when this is all said and done. And I pray that all of us will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I thank you for that and ask your blessing upon the pancake brunch. I ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Our final song is...